Good morning. Welcome to the Cary Church of Christ, our online worship service this morning. We're so glad you're here. If you're visiting with us and you're not a regular members of Cary, but you've joined us for worship, we're especially glad you're here as well, virtually with us this morning for worship. I'd like to thank all of our Cary family members who are online this morning. We're thankful for your patience and how we've been having to deal with virtual worship. It's different for all of us, but we are glad that you're participating and we look forward to being back together soon. Be mindful of all of our members who've been going through cancer treatments. We've had good results from some of our members. They continue to do well, but pray that they'll continue to be safe in the environment we're in. Be with those of our church family who've lost loved ones. Continue to keep them in your prayers as well. As you saw on the message board this week, good news. We're targeting June 28th to get back together in person for worship service. We'll, as long as the Wake County comes out of phase two on the 26th of June as planned, we're monitoring it weekly, but if we continue to do well as a county and a state, then we're looking forward to June 28th being our first Sunday morning back together as worship. And as you saw on the message board, it will be a worship service only. We'll probably have two worship services and split the congregation just to maintain social distancing to keep safe. But please be prayerful that that will be able to come off as we plan. Before we enter into worship, I would ask that we all try to put all the worldly things out of our mind and focus on why we're here. There's a lot of civil unrest that's been going on. We're very prayerful about that, especially for our members. We are very fortunate to have a very diverse congregation here in Cary. So as we enter into worship this morning, let's remember that we're all Christians and be prayerful for peace, for everything, and that we continue to make progress as a people, as a nation, but more so as a church. And remember to pray for each other and recognize that we all come from different backgrounds. Be respectful of that. And as we enter into worship this morning, let's remember why we're here. We're Christians and we're here to worship God. If you would, join me in prayer, please. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to be here this morning. We're thankful for all of our members. We pray for continued safety and well-being and health for our members. We pray that as we deal with all the many things that are going on right now with the virus, we pray that there will be a vaccine and a healing of everyone that's been impacted by that and be with those who've lost loved ones. Be with all of us as we deal with all the things that are going on in the nation today. We be, pray that we would continue to be able to view things as Christians, respect one another, respect everyone, respect everyone's opinions, and we pray for peace that we might all be able to get along and recognize that ultimately at the end of the day, it's our goal in life to live faithful, treat others as Christ would have treated them, be able to lead them to him so that we might all spend eternity in heaven. Be with us now as we enter into worship. We're thankful for the sacrifice of your son and his willingness to die on the cross for our sins. And it's his name we pray. Amen. Good morning. First song will be number one. Let's stand as we sing number one.
Good morning. The scripture reading today will be from Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Beginning in verse 1, it reads, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Christ, whom I preach to you, excuse me, this Jesus, who I preach to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews, who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, and they sought to bring them out to the people. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us to enjoy our company with each other. We thank you, Lord, for the many blessings of life that you give us. Most of all, we thank you for the, your son who came and died for us, Lord. Dear Lord, we ask you to be with those who have lost loved ones at this time. Please bless them and comfort them as only you can. Dear Lord, we ask you to be with all those who have graduated high schools and colleges. Please watch over them and may they uh, follow your word. Dear Lord, we ask you to be with our country this time. Watch over all of us. We thank you again for our congregation here, Lord. We ask you to be with those who are working to find a cure for this virus. Please bless them. Be with those who are in the hospitals at this time, Lord. May they return to the normal walks of life, Lord. Thank you again for all you've given us this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 530. 530.
Good morning. I'll be reading from Mark 14, beginning in verse 22. Mark 14, verse 22. And in this particular day and time, we've talked a lot about uh, the new norm. And as we try to get used to the new norm, uh, we talk about going out to eat and the different things that happen at the restaurants and the accommodations that they're making in order to open and, and serve people. And uh, we talk about maybe our places of employment and how they're adjusting the cubicles or the spacing at your, at your jobs and how that will look. We're certainly talking within the, um, the um, goal of coming back together as a congregation, uh, what it's going to look like and what, uh, what measures we're going to have to take here in order that we can uh, um, uh, provide that safety for those who may be still concerned as well as uh, the limitations that are put on us uh, but our, by our own um, um, civic uh, government. So when we start thinking about that new norm, uh, the beauty is, is that we may uh, be taking the Lord's Supper in a different method, a different way, um, uh, as long as it a, abides by the scripture. Um, but what doesn't change, what will never be a new norm, is why we take it. So we may uh, change how we do it, but we'll never change why we do it. And Mark speaks about that, and we have the words also on the table behind me, in remembrance of me. And as we read Mark 14, beginning in verse 22, it reads... And as they were eating, Jesus took bread. He blessed it and broke it. He gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> The why we take it is always regarding the torn, tattered body of Jesus Christ, Son of God, on the cross on behalf of each and every one of us, and the blood that was shed and continues to cover our uh, sins when we, when we ask for that. But we do it each and every Sunday, each and every Lord's Day, in remembrance of him. So let's pray. Father, we are grateful for the opportunity and the ways in which we can continue to remember you in this in this way, in the way in which we are told in the scriptures to remember you by partaking of, your, of the supper in this manner. We're mindful of the bread at this moment, Father, as we partake of it, that it represents your son's body that was crucified on that cross, was the nails driven into the hands, and his back was so torn and tattered, Father, prior to arriving. We thank you for his body that was, uh, that was given on and sacrificed on our behalf. Uh, we thank you for this and bless as we partake of the bread at this moment. In your son's most holy name, amen. Let us pray for the cup. Father, again, we approach you and we thank you for the blood that was shed on each of our behalf that covers our sins today when we ask. Thank you for your son and his willingness to go to the cross on our behalf. We do ask for forgiveness, Father, each and every time that we, that we sin, and we thank you for the reassurance, Father, through this uh, obedience of your son that we do have that forgiveness. Again, bless this cup as we partake of it. Everything we pray for is in your son's most holy name. Amen. We now have an opportunity, regardless of where we are, to give back of our blessings to the work that's being done here at the Cary Church. As I think about how to give again and the ways in which we're changing in this, quote, new norm, I'm grateful for the um, fourth, fourth sight uh, of the leadership here and the skill set of those who were able to set up uh, the ability to be able to give online. But that's not the only way in which we can give. We certainly can 
can mail in our contributions. We can bring them by the, the, the building uh, and drop them off, but we do have a responsibility and an obligation to continue to support the work that's done here uh, through the Cary Church, whether it be in the immediate community or whether it be um, statewide, nationwide, worldwide, we do continue to um, make those efforts and, uh, and unfortunately uh, it takes funds to do that. So consider the blessings that you have and consider the ways in which you can give and the methods, uh, the new methods that are available also to you. So let us pray at this time. Father, we are mindful of those blessings that we're so undeserving of, Father, but you continue to bless us when we ask. We do think uh, during this time of those who are hurting, whether it be financially, emotionally, or otherwise, Father, we continue to think of them, we hold them up in prayer, and we lift them to you that you can wrap your loving arms around them and, and comfort them in whatever ways that they're needing, Father. Take the funds, Father, and we pray that the leadership will find uh, and continue to use these in ways that expand the gospel and uh, do the work that uh, they know needs to be done according to the scriptures. Bless us as we give, Father, that we can in turn uh, receive as we're uh, blessed and, and promised in the scriptures as well. We thank you again for this opportunity and the ways in which we have to contribute. It's everything we pray for is in your son's most holy name. Amen. If you're like me, you probably grew up going to vacation Bible school. I know even now when we have vacation Bible school, usually one of the songs we sing towards the end of our week of Bible class with our kids is Booster, Booster, Be a Booster, that Bible school song that we sing in Boost Your Bible class or to boost your Bible school into next year. We're giving that encouragement, so to speak, to push forward concerning what it means to have a Bible class. 
We think about Bible class and the concept that we have now when we are able to gather together and even that we have now online. We have Bible class for the purpose of opening up God's Word and expounding upon it. We use it more in the format that we can ask questions, that we can gather together. And we do the same thing in when we're teaching our children concerning Bible class and we cover different topics concerning the Bible and different, uh, different subjects. And so we understand how important Bible class is and what Bible school should mean to us. From our reading in Acts chapter 17 verses 1 through 5, we can gain some insight into what makes the best Bible school ever. And so I don't want you to miss the fact when we look at Acts chapter 17 in the first few verses, when Paul went up to Thessalonica, he went to the synagogue of the Jews. Now synagogue in the Greek is a word that means a going together place. And so you would have 70 adult Jewish males to have, or rather you would have to have 70 adult Jewish males to have a synagogue. And there was one in the city of Thessalonica where Paul was now located. Paul made his way there for, and for three Saturdays, they studied together concerning God's word. And so we have an example of what it means to sit together, to study, to expound upon. And we're going to look at that more in depth in just a few moments of what it means to expound upon and to study God's Word. We're given that reference in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, to study ourselves approved unto God, a workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing and teaching accurately the Word of truth. And so as Paul has made his way there for the next three Saturdays, as they're going to open up God's Word, this is this going together place, this synagogue of the Jews was nothing more than a place that they can come together to study God's Word just as our building is much of a place that we not only come together to study God's Word as the church, but also that we can worship God together in spirit and in truth. So this going together place, as we see in the Greek, was a Bible school or a Bible class. So as we read these five verses, let's think about the process that we want to look of their studying God's Word concerning the message involved and how they study this. But then finally, we want to notice the outcome. So let's first look at the process. So what happened when they sat down and they began to study together in this going together place? Notice with me Acts 17 verses 1 through 5. It said, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue, this going together place of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus was whom I preached to you in Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joining Paul and Silas. So the convinced obeyed, were listening to what he had to say. But verse 5, But the Jews who were not persuaded became envious, took some of the evil men of the marketplace and gathered a mob and set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So we notice the process here. When you look at Acts 17 and verse 2, the starting spot here says that Paul reasoned with them from the Scriptures. That is, he expounded, he opened up God's Word. This was a time that they would study God's Word or the Bible. Now, the Bible that we have today in the form that we have it in, and even in our electronic form, certainly is not the same uh, reference that we want to make concerning the Bible back then. The Bible we have begins with Genesis and goes to the book of Revelation, the Old Testament and the New Testament together. The Bible they had went from Genesis to the book of Malachi, one of the minor prophets. So the Bible that we have wasn't the same then in relation that it wasn't in codex form, rather it was in bound form. And so they were in a scroll format. And so they would pull out the scrolls and they would unroll it and they would go to where they had stopped the previous Sabbath and they would start reading and studying it there. And so they would study what they had from God's Word. It was, after all, a Bible class. It was God's Word that they were opening up. So if we go to Acts 18 and verse 24... We read of a man by the name of Apollos that was born in Alexandria. It says, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. And so Alexandria, you have to remember, was this intellectual center or hub of that particular time. The man Apollos was an intellectual center. Um, or rather Alexandria was an intellectual center of the hub, and this man Apollos was 
from that intellectual center. So he was a very intelligent individual. In Acts 18 and verse 24, it says that he was an eloquent man. That means that he could speak and that he could speak with mightiness and um, that he could be um, centered upon the scripture there, that he can be confident in what he was saying. So 200 years before Jesus was even born in the city of Alexandria, 70 Jewish scholars got together and translated the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures into a modern translation of Greek language that we call today the Septuagint. And so when we read of Apollos being eloquent in speech, he knew this modern translation and he can point things out to people and looking at the Greek, but also understanding the Hebrew and take note of it. And what Apollos did in Achaia, Paul did in Thessalonica. That is, they reason, they open up the scriptures. So it says in 18 and verse 28 that Apollos publicly convinced people with the scriptures who Jesus was. So it wasn't what he was just saying, but he was, as he was opening up these Old Testament scrolls, he was pointing to who Jesus was. And so you see, you had the great Bible studies together as they were in this going together place in the synagogue studying God's word. So Paul, doing the same thing that Apollos did, was reasoning with them, and Paul shared thoughts with these people. Paul showed them how to think concerning the scriptures of what it says, and they shared their thoughts together. It records in Acts 17 and verse 2 that Paul reasoned with them from the scriptures. Reason carries this idea of speaking thoroughly through the scriptures to debate or to talk about the Bible, to talk about God's word. That's what we do in a Bible class. A Bible class that we have is not simply a lecture. It's not simply to tell people, but it's also to reason with them. And this is what a great Bible class does. They discuss the scriptures daily, don't they? They talk about these things. And so when we think about that, when they're talking about the best Bible school ever, if you travel down just a few verses to Acts 17 and verse 17, Paul is now in the city of Athens. And so Paul encounters the philosophers and the Epicureans and the atheists and the fatalists of that day. Notice Acts 17 and verse 17. It records, Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who of the happenings there. And so it records here that it says that he reasoned and debated with them. Can you imagine, imagine rather how challenging this was and must it have been for the Jews as those who had slain the Son of God, as Paul is expounding upon Jesus Christ and why this came to fruition concerning the fulfillment of Old Testament. And so, but that's what he did. They studied the Word of God. That's a good Bible class. And it reads in Acts 17 and verse 3, opening and alleging, maybe your translation says, or explaining and demonstrating to them God's Word. Explaining means to open up thoroughly, to talk about what it says. So what's in the jar, Larry? I don't know. Let's open it up and see what's inside. The only way that we can see the contents of the jar is to take the lid off and to see what's in there and unpack it. When we expound upon God's Word, and I know a word that you hear me say hundreds of times is the word context. When we study God's Word and we open it up, we have to keep in context what's being said to us. Not just pulling one verse, but taking everything together. That's what makes a great Bible class. So we open up the lid of Scripture and we pour out the contents. Jesus, if you recall, in His walk to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24, He spoke to these two unnamed disciples. And it says in Luke 24 and verse 27, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, He expounded to them all the Scriptures, the things concerning Himself. So Jesus didn't begin to enlighten them concerning Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and some of the other books that we have in the New Testament, but rather it says that he began at Moses and the prophets and expounded to them the scriptures, opening those things up and telling them who he was based upon Old Testament prophecy. And so the word expounded is a word that means hermeneutics, which means the study of study. When I was in preaching school, we took hermeneutics. That is, we learned how to study the Bible how to accurately divide, again, teaching correctly as we see in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. So Jesus got down deep into the scriptures concerning himself. Now you look at Luke 24, verses 31 through 32. And their eyes were opened, it says, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us 
the scriptures. So Jesus being the word expounded to them the scriptures concerning himself that they might believe and understand. Open the scriptures, Luke 24, 32, the same meaning that we see in Acts 17 and verse 3 that Paul is now doing with those in Thessalonica, which Paul is addressing to them. And now here's the process. We go to the Bible and we think out loud together. This was the process of the greatest Bible school ever. They opened up God's word and they processed and they thought out loud together and they discussed it. Now let's look at the message here. Why did they, or rather, what did they study about? Well, Acts 17 and verse 3 again reads, He reasoned and alleging or demonstrating the Christ. Demonstrating means to place alongside. So watch what he's doing here as Paul is demonstrating and teaching and expounding upon the Scriptures. What was he doing? They opened up the Old Testament scrolls, the Bible, in giving a very, very thorough understanding of the Old Testament, Paul took Jesus and he placed Jesus alongside the teachings of the Old Testament. So they can see parallel what Paul was addressing here concerning who Jesus was in Old Testament scriptures. So look at their message. The message was a message about Jesus. Our Bible classes need to constantly lead us to Jesus. Our Bible classes need to be Bible classes about Jesus. What's the theme of the Old Testament? Jesus is coming. What's the theme of the New Testament? Jesus has come and He's going to come again. And so study the Bible, get to Jesus. If we don't get to Jesus, we lose our way. So we've got to follow the path. Remember, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. The message of Christ was, get to Jesus. Pay attention to me, right? So read with me more of Acts 17 and verse 3. It says that he demonstrated that Jesus had to suffer. So he took the Old Testament scriptures, placed Christ alongside concerning the Old Testament prophecies to put it parallel with who Jesus was and what he had to go through. Why did he suffer? One reason, you and me in sin. You and me sinned is why Jesus had to suffer. And so the Son of Man came to what? Seeking to save that which was lost. Luke chapter 17. So what are we talking about? They're talking about in the Jewish synagogue. They're opening up the Bible. And Paul is placing alongside and explaining to them why Jesus had to suffer for our sins. So a great Bible school does more than just direct us to Jesus. It also focuses on us focuses us on who we are, and the changes that we need to make for Jesus. And so when we think about that, he not only had to suffer, but he had to rise again from the dead. Romans 4.25 says that he was raised for our justification, just as if I had never sinned. Sanctify, pulling me out of the world and placing me into Christ. Now watch what Paul did here. Paul opened up the Bible. They, though, they thought out loud... And the, with the Bible, placing Jesus alongside, as we've mentioned, trying to understand what the Bible said about Jesus Christ, who died for our sins so that we can be justified as if we'd never sinned. You see, what a Bible class does is it takes God's words, it takes God's word, and it opens that word up. And it says, this is what God wants for, for me and for his glory, and Jesus is the one who made it possible. When I watch some of these quote-unquote televangelists on TV and never once do I see them other than waving their Bible around, opening up God's Word, and reading from it, and expounding upon it, it makes me scratch my head and say, how are people going to know God if you don't show them God's Word? How are they going to know God if you don't show them what they must do? If you can't teach them and expound upon the Scriptures and put Christ parallel to that. So we study for that reason. So what was the outcome? Some of the outcome was positive, and some of it was not. Acts 17, verse 4, it said that some of them were persuaded, they were convinced. So as Paul placed Jesus and demonstrated who he was, putting it alongside Old Testament scriptures, some people said, I get it, I understand. Acts 17, and verse 5, it said the Jews which believed not, some of them were not convinced. If you've ever studied the Bible with someone Sometimes people will come into that Bible study with this preconceived idea or understanding of what they want you to know rather than having an opening mind or an open mind and an open heart. 
And sometimes people are not going to believe what the Bible says because sometimes it's what they've always known. Remember the Jews that Paul is approaching here in their synagogue, this going together place, as he's opening up the Old Testament principles, he's placing along Christ and some are going, no, that's not what it says. Sometimes you're going to run into that. And so they weren't convinced because of their personalities. They were envious and what happened because of it. And I've had this happen to me in Bible studies. I've had people basically verbally attack me, telling me that I was apostate and I was wrong for what I was teaching, especially if I teach someone that baptism is necessary for salvation. And so the same result then happened here with Paul. There was this attack. What about our Bible classes? May I suggest that the Bible teachers... Or may I suggest the Bible teaches us to accept with meekness the engrafted Word of God. And so we are to study and for what reason to make certain that we're right with God. And sometimes we have to swallow a little crow or eat a piece of humble pie when we come to an understanding of seeing something in the Bible and realize that we've perhaps been teaching it wrong or understood it wrong. And so we're to study and for what reason? We want to be right when we stand before God. That's what the Bible is telling us. That's what Bible study is all about. That's what Bible class is all about, that we might open it up and understand it collectively together. I miss our time together in Bible class when we can open up His Word and we can talk about these things together and reason through the Scriptures. That's why Bible class is so important for us together as a family. It's not just something the elders have added on in addition to to make us be here more. It's something because we understand God's Word is what directs us and helps us walk through this life, that we can understand what God wants from us. So in receiving and studying the Word of God, notice the end of Acts chapter 17, and notice the response that Paul gets, which with these three responses best suits your response to studying the Bible. Look at Acts 17, verses 32 through 34. And it says, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. So parted from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among, the, among them were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And so it says in Acts 17 and verse 4, again, that outcome was that some were persuaded, some believed. But as we get to the latter part, notice the response that he gets. Some mocked, others said, we'll hear you again. It said, however, some men joined him and believed him. Which of these best describes you? Do you believe in what the Bible says as you place God's Word along in your life? Have you rejected the Bible? Have you said, well, I better think about that some more, and I don't really know if that's something I should follow? Or have you accepted what the Bible says for fact? Because our soul depends upon that fact. Receive with meekness the engrafted Word of God, which is able which is able to save your souls. Remember what Paul said in Romans 1 and verse 16? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. If you have a faith that moves you, that points you towards God, I hope that you'll respond with that faith today. As we always want to offer concerning the invitation is an opportunity for you to address God. And if that involves prayer, that's a prayer that you can say right now, asking God to forgive you if you're a child of God, if you've made a mistake, if you're not walking in lockstep with Him, if you've set aside His Word and allowed it to collect dust, if you haven't placed alongside Jesus with the Scriptures, then maybe it's time to rededicate yourself to the cause of Christ, knowing that the Bible is what's going to help you get there. And so ask God to forgive you. Devote more time into His Word. Place Jesus alongside that Word, making sure that you see Him in the Scriptures because He's the one that's going to save you. If you're a person that you've listened and you've reasoned with us today as you see that God's Word is what instructs us and tells us what we must do concerning eternity, then let me tell you what else it's going to tell you. It says that you've got to be obedient to be forgiven. That involves a process by which God has said, we must receive or how we receive that free gift of salvation. It's a gift that's given based upon the condition by which we accept it. And it's not difficult. God's commands are not grievous or hard for us to understand. But God said, if you're willing to believe in his word, Mark 16, 15 and 16, if you're willing to accept it as fact and walk by faith, as the book of Hebrews tells us, if you're willing to put away your past by repenting of your sins and telling God that's not a person that you want to be, 
as Jesus addressed in Luke 13 and verse 3. If you're willing to confess Jesus with your mouth that He is the Son of God, Romans 10, 9, and 10. And finally, if you're willing to have your sins washed away in baptism, Acts 2, 38. Then you're taking God's Word for fact, for truth, and knowing that it's telling you exactly what you must do to be saved. And so if you need to do that, if you want to reach out to us, please contact us here at the building. You can find our information on our webpage at carrycoc.org, or you can email me at minister at carrycoc.org. Let us help you, but please don't put it off because we don't know what tomorrow holds. I'm so glad you were able to be here with us for worship in just a few moments. We're going to sing this song of encouragement, and in that moment as you sing this song, if there's something you're struggling with, if you need to be forgiven, if you want to become a Christian, don't put it off. Please contact us. Thank you again. We love you. We miss you. And God bless.
Let us pray. Father, we are so thankful that we have had this opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth, and we pray as we leave that we will always do the things that are pleasing in thy sight, Father. We, we know that you're always with us in this time that we're separated from each other of our church group, but we are united in one with you in spirit and in truth, and we pray that our faith will continue to grow and things will get back to normal soon. We're so thankful that we have you as our father and the ones that and the one that will look after us and take care of us. We're so thankful for all that you do for us in our lives. Can be with us now as we go about our daily lives. Thank you for all that you do in this prayer we ask in our son's name. Amen.